longer than we expected, but still we would like to start with our third panel today. So we invite everybody to come back to the conference room. We invite our audience online uh, to get maybe a tea or a coffee and join us again. And uh, a very warm welcome to our speakers here on the panel. Uh, you can see four speakers. There is uh, one more uh, speaker. It is Professor Alena Pfosa connecting online. And uh, the topic of our panel is heritage, memory and international relations. I'm happy to <coughs> moderate this panel. My name is Anne-Marie Franke and I'm a member of the team of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. And I have the pleasure to introduce um, my colleague, Professor Jan Riddle. You met him already this morning when he <coughs> said a warm welcome to everybody on behalf of the steering committee of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. But now he is in the role of a scholar. Jan Riddle is a historian and his research areas are Central and Eastern Europe and Polish-German relations in 19th and 20th centuries. Until 2010, he was a researcher and professor at Jagiellonian University and is currently a professor at the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Between 2001 and 2005, he headed the Office of Culture, Science and Information at the Polish Embassy in Berlin. Since 2008, he has been Poland's representative on the board of the Polish-German Foundation for Sciences. Connected to his uh, today's lecture is his um, <coughs> membership of the International Advisory Boards of the Bergen-Belsen Memorial and Mauthausen Memorial. Professor Riddle, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you can see uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the former Guzen concentration camp, which probably few of you know anything about, is located in Austria, only four kilometers uh, from, uh, from the much more famous uh, Mauthausen concentration camp. Uh, the Gusen camp belonged uh, to the uh, worst third category of concentration camps according to the typology used by the SS. Uh, from uh, 1940 to the end of 1941, Poles constituted uh, the vast majority of prisoners then until the end of the war. They were the largest group uh, in the camp. According uh, to uh, the most conservative estimates, a total of uh, no less than 25,000 Poles were impris imprisoned uh, there, uh, 30 uh, uh, 13,000 of whom died there. The highest estimate found in the literature uh, is a total of 35,000 Polish prisoners, of whom as many as uh, 27,000 lost their uh, lives there. Uh, among them were thousands of teachers, engineers, scholars, uh, cultural activists, uh, government and local government officials. Uh, when the camp was liberated, uh, there were 8,500 Poles, uh, including uh, 1,300 citizens of uh, Polish citizens of Jewish nationality. Uh, Guzen is therefore one of the largest Polish, Polish cemeteries, or to be more precise, cemeteries of ethnic Poles uh, from the Second World War. Larger cemeteries of ethnic Poles are only Warsaw as a result of the uh, uprising uh, for 1944, at least uh, 100 uh, 64,000, and Auschwitz, 
70 uh, or 75,000 victims. The victims of Guzen, on the other hand, show many similarities with the victims of the Katyn uh, massacre, both in terms of their number uh, and their social intelligentsia uh, profile. Therefore, it's not difficult to understand that at the moment when the attention of Polish society, of media, Polish media and politics turns to the Polish victims of the Second World War, Guzen becomes one of its focal points. And it is here, to use a colloquial phrase, that the uh, problem begin. Because Guzen, uh, a place of martyrdom, I use uh, the term advisedly, uh, oh, place of martyrdom of many tens of thousands of prisoners from almost 13, 30 European countries has been subject to miscreant ob obliteration and suppression of memory uh, for many decades. In the summer, of uh, 1945, the quarries uh, and uh, the camp at Guzen were taken over by the Soviet occupation authorities uh, that uh, set up the Granitwerke Guzen company there and began to extract stone uh, on their own account. They were not in, in the least uh, interested uh, uh, in preserving the camp equipment and buildings, and within the short time, most of remnants uh, was taken away, <laughs> devastated, or demolished. It is unlikely that they did, do, uh, did not uh, uh, realize the value of these uh, objects uh, as a testimony to the unprecedented uh, suffering of the victims of the camp. Since they had already handed over the Mauthausen building, the buildings of Mauthausen concentration camp to the authorities of the Republic of Austria in 1947, so that, uh, that a memor memorial site could be established there. In 1955, after the conclusion of the Staatsvertrag with Austria, which ended the occupation of that country, the Soviets handed over to it the stripped, uh, striped and devastated Guzen camp grounds. The quarries uh, at Guzen were returned to their former owner, uh, the Poschacher company. Uh, Apparently, Mauthausen completely satisfied the, the demand, uh, demand of the Republic of Austria at the time, this first victim of Hitler, according to uh, Josef Vissarionovich Stalin's interpretation, to uh, commemorate the victims of uh, Nazism and uh, demonstrate international solidarity uh, in this regard. The international community accepted this situation uh, as demonstrated uh, by the park of national monuments to the victims at the entrance to the camp, which was created over, over time. Uh, the Communist People's Republic of Poland did not make effort uh, to com commemorate Guzen either. Uh, meanwhile, at Guzen, uh, at the same time as the camp grounds passed first to the ownership of the Republic of Austria and then to the municipal municipality of Langenstein, the parceling out of plots of land began uh, their sale uh, uh, to private individuals, the removal of the uh, supposedly redu redundant uh, remains of the camp buildings, and finally, the, develop the development of new residential buildings. 
when, when it was expected that the rem remnants of the crematorium of Guzen uh, would soon be demolished, former Guzen inmates from France, Italy, and Belgium made effort uh, to save them. After much endeavor, uh, the initiators succeeded in buying the crematorium at the surrounding uh, area. In the following years, Italian architects at their own expense created a dignified framework to, the, uh, to that, this tragic place. It was completed in 1965, 20 years after the camp liberation. It was the first commemoration of the former Guzen concentration camp. In the same year, the Austrian state sold the most important surviving post-camp building, namely the gate building, uh, which was uh, both the camp commandant's office and the uh, punishment cells uh, uh, to private owners. It is uh, commonly, uh, this building is commonly referred to as uh, the uh, 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 as a Jour house, it's a specific terminology. Uh, uh, the distinctive Nazi camp architecture was transformed by a local entrepreneur uh, into a kitsch pseudo Italian villa uh, by adding outbuildings, balustrades, and other ornaments surrounded by a well-tended garden with swimming pool. Sorry. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the current level of the development of the former camp campsite is well illustrated by the following photograph. Mm. Uh, the, uh, uh, black, uh, black and white photograph shows uh, the camp and the f uh, color, colored photographs is, is the uh, today result of, of, uh, of politics, uh, local politics. Uh, and the second map, mm -hmm. a similar impression is left by the plan shown here uh, on which the modern buildings are marked in dark color, uh, while the former buildings and barracks of the camp uh, uh, with a black dashed line. In the 1990s in Poland uh, and other uh, countries, uh, it began to be recognized that the Hitler to total focus on Mauthausen as a memorial site with the simultaneous devastation of grounds and uh, of the larger uh, and more horrific uh, um, concentration camp that was Guzen was undignified and unfair. Criticism of the situation at Guzen have grown stronger over uh, over the, uh, the years. At the beginning of uh, the 2000s, mm, uh, on the initiative of the former Polish ambassador to Austria and foreign minister Władysław Bartoszewski, an international committee was set up to initiate and support the construction, uh, construction of, mo of a modern small exhibition facility on Guzen site. This led to construction of Besucher Centrum, Visitors Center, in 2004. It was financed primarily by Poland. It houses a small photographic exhibition explaining the history of the Guzen camp and the information desk. Uh, in the more than 10 years that followed, uh, sorry, uh -huh. Oh, yes. Uh, in the more than 10 years that followed, contrary to the expectations of former prisoners, their families, historians, and memorial experts, the Austrian 
authorities did absolutely nothing to save the still existing original facilities at Guzen uh, and to raise awareness in society about the history of the site. This kind of profound indifference which caused increasing concern in Poland contrasted strongly with the expansion of the network of memorials in the Federal Republic of Germany. The great investment movement in museums and memorials did not bypass Poland either. Against this background, the passivity and procrastination of the Republic of Austria was an anachronism and was becoming downright irritating. Enough become enough in uh, 2016, when news reached Poland that the private owners of the uh, last patches of land at uh, the former Guzen concentration camp preserved in a state close to the original had started using uh, bulldozers to destroy them. The, Polish me uh, the media in Poland devoted dramatic articles and programs to the issue uh, and Polish diplomats intervened. On uh, 3rd of June uh, 2016, a firm open letter on stopping the degradation and preserving the memory uh, of K KL Concentrationslager Guzen con addressed to the Austrian Minister of Interior was written by the directors of uh, the most important Polish memorials as well as the uh, director of the po Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and the chief uh, rabbi of Poland. The open letter uh, achieved its goal only to a small extent, as the area of the Guzen Roll Call Square and three, three original buildings adjacent to it was officially recognized uh, as a monument and placed under appropriate protection. A major clash uh, occurred uh, in the following year, 2017, uh, on, on 5th uh, of May, uh, on the anniversary of the Camp Liberation, a large ceremony was held at Guzen, attended for the first time ever by the Austrian President Alexander van der Bellen. Uh, at the head of the large Polish delegation was the Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage, uh, Ms. Magdalena Gavin. In her speeches and interviews to the Polish and Austrian press, this politician repeated, uh, as is well known, uh, uh, the justified uh, criticism uh, of the Austrian side, but did so according to Austrian eyewitnesses and media in such an emotional and harsh manner that Austria treated it as an unjustified attack. On 8th of May 2017, the director of the newly established authority, Austrian authority named Mauthausen Memorial, uh, which is in charge of all Austrian Second World War memorials, Barbara Gluck, start, stated uh, uh, in an interview with the Viennese Daily, the, Der Standard, uh, I uh, quote, uh, I cannot recognize the criticism Furthermore, I think it is a, it is a pity that, the, that a weekend dedicated to liberation anniversary commemoration uh, um, is being used for something like this. It is quite clear to me that the Polish Law and Justice Party is purse, pursuing a political strategy uh, uh, that only uh, serves Polish nationalist historiography. Uh, the evocation of the memory policy of the Law and Justice Party, party's government, uh, formed 
uh, at the end of uh, 2015 is quite interesting. Let us note that the problem of Guzen had been acknowledged uh, in Poland many years prior uh, to its, its formation, to, to the formation of this government. And the Austrian policy had also been criticized before that. However, there is no doubt that it was only after the formation of the uh, law and justice run government that efforts to change the state of affairs prevailing at Guzen became more intense and moved into the public forum. Was this a manifestation of a Polish nationalist vision of history? Certainly not. Uh, uh, Guzen is, as I have already explained, one of the largest Pol Polish cemeteries of the Second World War, and uh, there was and is and is no reason to tolerate its destruction and accept its oblivion. Uh -huh. Oh well. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry. Uh, in fact, uh, that Austrian side was not entirely uh, idle. The Austrian State Property Administration probably already 2017 entered into, the dis into, into discreet negotiation with the private owners of the land and agreed with them plots, uh, which plots could be purchased uh, without unnecessary fares. The Polish side, however, did not uh, uh, know these facts or uh, knew them only partially, so its irritation continued to grow. In the circumstances, on, uh, on 6th, uh, 6th of uh, December uh, 2019, the Polish Prime Minister Mateusz uh, Morawiecki publicly announced that if the Republic of Austria did not buy back uh, the still available part of the campgrounds in the near future, uh, the po Poland would uh, do so and set up its own memorial and build a youth meeting house there. This announcement made a big impression in Austria, where until now the determination of uh, the Polish authorities seems uh, to have been still underestimated. It can be assumed that uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki announcement led to, uh, to a kind of breakthrough uh, as the coalition agreement between uh, the ÖVP and the Green Party on the basis of which Chancellor Sebastian Kurz's second cabinet was formed on 1st January uh, 2020 included a provision for the purchase and uh, uh, of the camp grounds at Guzen and the creation of memorial there. In turn, the Polish side uh, weakened uh, its public criticism on Austrian's handling of Guzen by focusing on securing um, as much influence as possible over the planning of the new memorial. Uh, I'm, I'm going to the end. Uh, Polish uh, activities uh, since um, uh, consisted of a kind of diplomatic ceterum censo in the form of regular visits by high-ranking Polish politician to the site. The starting point uh, for the final stage of work uh, on a dignified uh, and modern commemoration uh, of the victims of Guzen camp was reached on March uh, uh, of the 8th of March this year, when the completion uh, of the purchase of available plots of land was announced in Vienna. Uh, the political closure of this phase turned out uh, uh, to be a this year's state, commemora state commemoration of the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the Guzen camp. Uh, this took place on 4th of May, 
and brought together the entire, I emphasize, uh, the entire political leadership of Aust Austria to Gusen, President van der Bellen, Chancellor Karl Neamer, uh, Vice Chancellor Werner Kogler, uh, Parliamentary President Sobotka, key ministers, members of parliament, regional authorities, and so on and so on. Uh, all were there. At the evening of uh, after evening uh, ceremony held uh, on the ruined and rubble stone uh, camp assembly ground, uh, the Austrian president said, "The concentration camp Gusen was for a long time in the shadow of what is known as the main camp Mauthausen. Gusen was not present in our memory culture as much as uh, as it should have been." because it was a place of extermination. Now Austria will do its utmost to transform it into a suitable place of remembrance, learning, and meeting. Uh, a site uh, that is worthy uh, of the memory of all victims. Yes, uh, um, it is also clear uh, no, 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 it's not necessary, uh, or, or let us try. Uh, <laughs> it is also clear that those who will uh, be uh, given the mission to prepare the concept for the new facility and the organizers of the new memorial uh, site have uh, great problems to solve and in solving them, they will be watched closely by Polish diplomats, experts, and public opinion. The organizers can, of course, count on the uh, comprehensive help of Polish experts. Uh, that is for sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Professor Riddle, for this uh, case study and one can say with a happy end for the moment and maybe one more uh, happy information just to let you know that um, this year our youth project Sound in the Silence took place actually in Mauthausen Gusen. It's a project where young people through uh, arts learn about the history and they spend summer at the summer no now in in, in, in in September one week on the spot and this was a very good cooperation with the Mauthausen Memorial. I would now like to switch to our next lecture and um, it uh, is the floor of Mrs. Uh, Professor Alena Pfosa who is connected to us online. Oh, there she is. Welcome. We are happy to see you and to have you in this panel. Uh, Alena Pforza is a senior lecturer in communication and media studies at the Lowborough University in United Kingdom. Her main areas of expertise include memory and in contested settings, heritage and tourism industries, borders and borderlands, and qualitative and arts-based methods. She is uh, currently completing a research project which examines the production and contestation of memory in Russian tourism to post-Soviet cities. So, uh, we are glad to get this lecture on memory diplomacy in tourism navigating contested pasts in Russian post-imperial tourism. Mrs. Um, Fosey, the floor is yours, but now I lost you here on the screen. Okay, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes? yes, we can hear you, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you for Jade and Bartosz and the whole team for organizing this wonderful conference. I'm extremely sorry that I can't be with you in Warsaw um, right now due to different reasons, work reasons, family reasons, but I'm glad to be uh, connected uh, with you over the screen and following the, the interesting presentations like that. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a project I've been working on for several years. Uh, 
which focuses on Russian tourism to uh, cities in the post-Soviet space that used to be part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union are, are now located in the independent states in Russia's neighborhood. When I started the project, um, that was, of course, already after the annex Russian annexation of Crimea and the uh, Donbass war. Uh, we did the field work in 2019 in the summer. Uh, but it was before the Russian invasion of um, full-blown invasion of Ukraine, so the context has changed dramatically. I'm not going to reflect on that very much today, uh, apart from uh, like a short note to that in the end. But I'm uh, happy to uh, also answer questions in in, in 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 that respect. So this is a historical presentation, if you will. But I um, I also want to make a larger point about uh, tourism as a way of as as one way of studying. Uh, memory in the international arena. And the starting point of the project was really that tourism is actually really significant in how we learn about the past of other states. We travel to places, we read in our guidebooks, we uh, go on guided tours, we visit heritage sites and museums. It's one of the uh, main ways apart from school education and, uh, and films. Um, Another way of like mediated representations of the past, how we how we learn about um, about um, about the past. But um, I would think that tourism has been hugely um, under underestimated or overlooked in both memory scholarship, but also in international relations, on um, as um, as uh, something that is significant in how um, uh, past are produced um, transnationally and uh, and circulated. Um, the, the, there's a large body of scholarship uh, of, of, of memory in memory studies looking at uh, transnational uh, memory and uh, it focuses on, uh, on a lot of different things but, not, but tourism really doesn't figure there. I think one of the reasons uh, we can say is of course that tourism is seen as, uh, as often not serious and not consequential uh, and uh, the project seeks to counter that. So, a lot of work focuses uh, in, in, in relation to transnational memory on memory wars and memory conflicts on one hand and on the other hand on the creation of uh, cosmopolitan memories that go beyond the, the boundaries of the nation state. And for a long time, I wasn't quite sure, like, where do I put tourism? It doesn't quite fit into these two categories of scholarship. And, uh, and uh, uh, then I came across the, the works in relation to memory diplomacy. And I think that's actually quite a useful way of looking at what's happening in tourism. So understand memory uh, diplomacy following Tim Winter's definition as a set of processes where cultural and, um, and natural past are shared between and across nations and become subject to exchanges, collaborations and forms of cooperative governments. And I'm looking specifically at memory diplomacy in guided tours um, that allows me to examine the micropolitics of uh, transnational memory making or memory diplomacy. Um, it, it, uh, looking at guided tours requires to adjust uh, the understanding of memory diplomacy to include a wider range of actors. So tour guides and tourists are here seen as significant actors of memory diplomacy. And it also requires us to move beyond instrumentalist approaches of memory diplomacy. Often memory diplomacy is about the projection of a particular image that Bartosz has spoken about in the first panel. Um, um, to a foreign audience, so as in nation branding and tourism campaigns. But here, what we uh, what we can see in the case of guided tours, it's about a negotiation of the past, um, a co-production of the past between uh, tour guides and and tourists, a much more relational understanding of memory diplomacy. So that's the first body of literature that I'm drawing on, on transnational memory and memory diplomacy. And the second one is uh, in relation to the communication of contested past. Uh, and um, there are, of course, different ways of researching uh, troubled, contested past and the tourism industry. Uh, predominantly, research has focused, um, of course, in tourism office dedicated to troubled past, so heritage sites, museums uh, that fall under this category of dark tourism or that focus on the communication of difficult past, past related to um, histories of violence and suffering. Um, and uh, 
and in the project, I uh, chose a different focus. I was focusing on commercial walking tours that, tours that have a general orientation. So they really offer an overview of what's happening in a city. And they, they are different from these offers. I think they're important to examine what's happening there because they have a broad appeal and they're not just for audiences who are already interested in these troubled past. Um, so my interest is well, how do these uh, guided walking tours deal with memories that are contested and that also allows us then to examine other strategies in relation to questions around avoidance, practices of avoidance, but, but not only as I will show. Um, so this is a, a ERCC new investigator project which uh, finished early in this year. I'm working on a pro uh, book uh, at the moment, uh, which will come up with Paul Griff um, later next year, hopefully. And uh, of course, as we all know, Russian tourism to post-Soviet cities is, con is uh, situated in a contested geopolitical context. I had three case study locations, Tallinn, Kiev, and Almaty. Um, and uh, I chose them because of the different geopolitical relations uh, with Russia and Kiev already uh, at that moment, summer 2019, violent conflict, but still some Russians traveling to Kiev in Tallinn, contestations, quite hot contestations, but, uh, but not, uh, not at the same temperature as in Kiev and Almaty, uh, friendly relations with Russia. So different geopolitical contexts to get also insights into similarities and differences across uh, post-Soviet spaces. We did participant observations of guided tours and interviews with tour guides and tourists with a small team of researchers. Um, what can I say about uh, this navigation of contested memories in Russian tourism? I, I conceive of tour guides as mnemonic intermediaries, uh, who actually is quite a complex process. The process of tour guiding, it involves different acts of mediation. It involves mediation between tourists and hosts. It involves mediation between past and present, and also between the material space and the, and the interpretation of it. Uh, so it's a relational practice and tour guides spoke very openly about adjusting uh, the, the, the tour to the audience in terms of where the audience is coming from. In particular, those two tour guides who, who guided in different languages in English and Russian um, or English and German were quite interesting in reflecting upon how they adjust their tours um, to, um, to, to make them more interesting for the audiences and to connect with the knowledge of the audiences. And Russian tourists, so this was Russian speaking guided tours offered in these three cities. And uh, they, they are interesting because they attract, of course, not just Russians, but also other Russian speakers from post-Soviet republics or the US and Israel. And uh, one of the things that tour guides across the countries no noticed is uh, this, uh, this ambiguous character of guiding in, in Russian. On one hand, there's a big advantage of guiding in Russians because they can connect with the existing stock of knowledge of tourists from Russia. But at the same time, they're also aware that there, there are memory conflicts happening and it's a, they're very sensitive questions. And often tour, uh, tour guides reflected on the, the some of the tourists might be anxious and sensitive and really pick up on small words that they would use. So they need to be very careful in navigating this at uh, the past as a, as, a, as a very sensitive terrain. And what do they do in this, um, in this uh, context of conflict, um, of heightened sensibilities? I'll show two broad sets of practices now, and they overlap. I can't say that one set of tour guides does one thing and the other set of tour guides does the other thing, uh, but there's yet two kind of main strategies that I can observe. And the first one is really focusing on avoiding contested past and neutralizing contested past. So when you think about these city spaces, this, these are city spaces uh, which are shaped by different uh, histories and different uh, material heritage, but these are city spaces where tour guides often would come across sites that are linked to contested past. And these are just a few examples that I give you here on the slide. Uh, the, the body shape of a Maitan to death victim on Khrushchevsky Street in Kiev. And there's one example from the participant observation that the guide would stand there on the street and still carry on talking about the 19th century houses of the street and it's completely ignoring uh, the sh body shapes that were drawn there, um, uh, uh, um, marking the contours of the, of the shot uh, protesters from the Maidan protest. There are also uh, monuments to victims of, uh, of the famine in, in Almaty or memorial plaques to the victims of communist terror. So two guys need to make a decision, do they mention these sites and how they mention these sites? 
uh, and they engage in practices of spatial and narrative maneuvering. So in terms of spatial maneuvering, they of course can select the route through the city and can avoid some tour guides in Kiev, avoid Madan altogether because they don't want to talk about it. Um, they can uh, choose not to stop at the site and just uh, walk by. Um, or just stop for a for, for very quick stop um, and, uh, and 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 briefly mention um, a, a past that is linked to uh, to its particular sensibilities and contestations. So they can, uh, in that way, try to avoid conflict and contain um, the, 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 the conflict potential within the guided tools. Another strategy is that they try to neutralize uh, the contested past by choosing a fact-based language um, and, um, for example, avoiding expressions like occupation or colonization in relation to Soviet and Russian rule. And this is something that many tour guides speak about in the interviews, and you can also observe it in the, um, in, in the participant observation. So um, the first quotation here is about a tour guide saying, I try to avoid difficult topics and I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to fight over political issues. And then the second uh, quotation, this is a tour guide on Tallinn who talks about, who reflects on how she would avoid the, the word of occupation, the word that is used for characterizing the Soviet regime um, in, in Estonia. And she would find a way around it by just speaking about uh, the different foreign rulers that were, were there in, um, in Tallinn. We became part of the Soviet Union. We became, so it's just this crash course in history. And this is uh, the, the, the more contemporary part. We became part of the Soviet Union, 41 part of Nazi Germany, 44 again part of the Soviet Union. We stayed part of the Soviet Union till 1991. So she avoids uh, the word occupation and uh, doesn't give any interpretation of that time. She just uses it as a historical overview and then goes on to the next topic. And you can see in the quotation here that she says, although in my head it's occupation, I don't use the word not to provoke people, just to feel safe, better not to, you never know how they'll react. So there's a sense of conflicts can break out anytime. I'd rather stay on the safe side and avoid these. Uh, avoid these topics. Some tool guides also use uh, it explicitly that they say in the guided tours, this is not a political tour, so I'm going to keep it short and not talk about this anymore. Um, so cutting down, uh, cutting down, uh, talk about contested topics, that's one set of strat strategies trying to neutralize it. But there is, a, there is more to it, uh, more to the role of guided uh, of tour guides. Uh, tour guides feel that they're the face of the, of the city. They also often feel a responsibility towards the past, that they care for the past. And of course, although tour guides would like to uh, think of tourism as a depoliticized space, politics does intrude. It intrudes also often in the questions that tourists ask who are aware about the uh, conflicts that happen uh, around the past. They're aware of uh, uh, the Soviet regime being framed as an occupation, so they do ask questions about that. And um, tool guides, some tool guides actively uh, uh, talk about uh, these contested issues then to, to avoid tourists asking these questions, they integrate it in the, in the guided tour, others um, see if tourists are interested and then pick up on, on these uh, topics. So there are different, different strategies within that broader set of strategies. But very importantly, tour guides need to position themselves as expert when they talk about sensitive topics. Um, they use facts, um, um, historical data, they use uh, sources, they quote from sources to position themselves as people with storytelling rights um, who actually have, uh, uh, have um, an, a different position than tourists who, um, who, 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 who can question the, the expert position on tour guides um, in relation to these difficult topics. And uh, here's some things that tour guides do in the guided tours uh, yeah, to encourage understanding and dialogue. That some of them can try to, um, to bust myths and to create an understanding by explaining local interpretations. So to come back to the question of whether uh, the Soviet uh, uh, Soviet uh, regime in Estonia was an occupation, this is uh, an, a quotation from an interview with a, a tour guide who, si who says, 
um, there, there's a provocative question from tourists um, asking whether European Union is also an occupation. And then she says, you have to explain that without being rude, without being just yes, yes, yes. Explain the view of your local people and everything like that. This requires effort. Um, you don't try to make it personal. So here you can see an attempt to offer some interpretation. And we can see that in several guided tours where tourists really make an effort in trying to, uh, without emotionalizing to, 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 to explain why views on history are different. Uh, Togats also acknowledge different viewpoints, they point out controversies that exist, uh, some of them actively also embrace controversies and encourage a pluralist uh, view on history, where it's fine to have a different position on the past, but also then say there's the right of the local population to have their own interpretation of history, as in uh, the quotation that you can see here on the slide. The another strategy uh, which is very important that uh, that uh, tour guides follow is to try to de-emotionalize history, to try to distance the past from the present to say, and this, this works of course only in uh, in a context where where it's where there's not an extremely hot uh, co conflict around the past. So in, in Tallinn, this works better than than in Kiev. This attempt at distancing the past that the past is. Uh, is different from the present and in the present we can find relations of being together and finding some understanding. Um, also, Tugat often use jokes to de-emotionalize um, history and they can emphasize common experiences of, um, um, of uh, shared victimhood. How much time do I have? It's... I, could, I couldn't hear that now. Uh, five minutes left. Five minutes. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come to a conclusion now. Uh, what I've showed you so far uh, is, is these two sets of strategies. On one hand, uh, conflict avoidance and the, try, uh, the attempt to depoliticize tourism, um, um, leaving essentially tourist perceptions unchallenged. Um, and the other one, um, the, uh, the attempt to create some um, um, some understanding and some exchange. So what we could think of as a, as a as a as a more productive way of dealing with contested past. Um, one can ask whether whether the tourism industry uh, in a way caters to Moscow's uh, interest and to the Russian interpretation of the past because it is so much uh, oriented on conflict avoidance strategy. But I would argue we need to see what's happening in guided tours in the context of tourism being a hospitality industry with its own principles um, and own uh, practices that are characteristic for it. Um, it's shaped by particular professional practices, conventions of guided tours. It's shaped also by the interest of the visitors who ask questions or do not ask questions on a particular uh, topic. And uh, conflict avoidance is, uh, is, is a very prominent strategy because of this pragmatic orientation that we can see that we can get in the tourism industry. Uh, guided city tours are commercial. They rely on the, the good tours rely on the money that they get from the tourists. They rely on positive reviews they get from tourists. And many tour guides are also aware of the limited time that they are, have available. So if they open up um, a conversation about the past, um, uh, they, they say it's, it's often difficult to contain it. And then uh, uh, they, they still have many other things they want to talk about uh, rather than just working through uh, particular aspects of the, of, the, of the past. So due to this uh, commercial uh, character and the particular genre of the guided tour, the tourist perceptions are often left unchallenged, but uh, I showed some of the, uh, some of the possibilities also of, of the genre of guided tours in the presentation today. I want to end on a provocative note, um, um, asking whether actually tourism, even if it doesn't challenge tourist perception of the past, can also be seen as, uh, as, as something that is productive and bring people together. Um, there is a, an interesting body of scholarship uh, uh, from critical transitional justice and uh, People looking like ethnographically at post-conflict um, at conf post-conflict situations, and they try to understand how the avoidance of um, of, uh, of difficult past can also can can have different meanings. 
and uh, and can be also seen as something that is productive in itself. And uh, the work of Leah David, for example, uh, questions whether working through the past can actually, uh, she, she, she asked whether working through the past can actually also create uh, divisions and have a negative effect. So I'm drawing this on this scholarship to, to say that, uh, that even in, in situations where two guides might not be the ideal memory workers, how we m might want to imagine them as, uh, as trying to, to create a dialogue about the past. They can still bring people together uh, by, by creating positive relations in the present that are, fo that are focused around enjoyment, that are focused around being together in one space. And, uh, and this can work also um, against stereotypes that tourists hold. There are many Russian tourists who who can be anxious, they're not quite sure how the locals interpret the shared past, they're not quite sure whether they are welcome. And uh, by, uh, by having this experience of hospitality, they, they can question assumptions around uh, that the locals are hostile towards them and then reconsider some of the, uh, of the views of history that they have uh, in mind based on uh, what they see on television and also what their friends and family says. And we can see this noted by book two, tour guides and by the tourists of how tourism, even if it doesn't work through difficult past, can still open up um, and transit positions. The question that I have in the end is what happens now in a situation of war? Um, of course, this memory diplomatic encounters in tourism are not happening and a lot of the work is being undone. I would still say that there's some memories of tourism that, that are there that work as a potential for uh, counter mnemonic mobilization, but at a very limited scale, also because of the limits of what is happening in tourism. Uh, and uh, that's something that needs to be acknowledged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alena, for this uh, lecture and your critical questions you asked at the end. I'm sure there will be several questions here from the audience, and we'll come back to your provocative note uh, in the questioning, questioning and answering session at the end. But now I would like to invite Julia Eremenko to present her lecture, to introduce her. She's actually... Uh, just fresh arrived in Warsaw, here now since October, as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Political Science and International Studies at the Warsaw University. Uh, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the Trimberg Research Academy at the University of Bamberg from 2020 to 2022. She is a sociologist and political scientist. She defended her doctoral thesis on the topic World Cultural Heritage in Germany and Russia, the experience of Wismar, Stralsund, Vieliki Novgorod and Pskov at the University of Bamberg. Welcome and you have the floor, Julia. Thank you very much for invitation. May I have my pro... Well, actually, you see your presentation yeah. over there mm -hmm. and you also see the time running <laughs> and at a certain point running out, so please, <laughs> just to remind, it's 20 minutes and... Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I want to continue a little bit the topic of uh, heritage and uh, culture. So, um, nowadays we can see that there is more than a thousand world heritage sites all around the world and um, almost uh, 900 of them are world culture heritage sites. And the number of them growing every year. And at the same time, the obtaining of the world culture heritage status is very laborious process. So it's really important in the um, uh, stage of application to clearly um, argumented um, the site uniqueness and the historical background of the place. So the study attempt to find which memories are essential for preparing an application for the world culture heritage status and what memories try to be hidden at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so my study looks at the example of Hellerau, Germany, uh, this site is currently applying for world culture heritage status. Um, Hallerau covers uh, 140 hectares above Dresden Elbe Valley, 
which more than 800 buildings included. And it was built um, in between 1909 and 1914. The main materials for my study as semi-structured interviews with the city administration, a local activists, members of the organization who is responsible for the Hellerau side and representatives of um, Saxony experts in world heritage. At the same time, I use a narrative analysis of exhibition, what is presented in the Hellerau building. It's on the first floor of the visiting center, on the second floor, mm -hmm. with an interesting model in the middle, and in the corridor connected with this main hall. So free spaces. Um, this exhibition is located in the west side of the building of uh, Hellerau Festival Hall ground. And um, it was created in 2006. And after, in 2009, the book about this exhibition with materials from this exhibition was published. But um, every year or every two years, um, there is a new uh, exhibition board. So it's uh, not the same as in 2006. So I was interested what's changed after the years, what's new exhibition panels and how different stages of um, history was represented in, in this exhibition. It's interesting that if we will look in the main explanation about the exhibition on, of, on official website or in the book or even at the exhibition itself, um, we will find out that um, from the idea of funding the first German garden city and um, house estate and the first, uh, so, um, Hellerau Festival Hall, as in English, um, it's um, from the 1906 till nowadays development process. Um, this exhibition represents not only the history of Dresden, but also of Germany culture history in 20s and early 21st centuries. But what is inside of this exhibition? Um, this is the main building of um, fest uh, festival hall grounds, and now this is a museum. And um, if we look into the exhibition itself, we will find out there is two types of panels with um, not um, standard, not standardized uh, time period uh, explaining the history of Hellerau and uh, connected to specific topics. So there is two main uh, topics uh, it's uh, Hellerau as a Gardenstadt um, and Hellerau as, um, as a center of rhythmic institute and uh, information about the contemporary dance um, which was created um, there and um, contemporary dance till nowadays in, um, in this um, but you can see still uh, nowadays as an uh, event on Hellerau um, building. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a period of 60 years what's not really uh, influence this in exhibition. This is a period of um, uh, 30s, um, so the building was used by the police and the SS. And after this, from 1945, this building was used by the Soviet army, by the Red Army, uh, till 1992. So it's really, really long period, but in the exhibition you will see only one panel, mostly focused on this topic, and not uh, give us information about what happened during this time. 
but uh, maybe it will be okay for the World Heritage application at the same time if in this building of uh, main hall you will not see this. This is um, two paintings, uh, what is um, on the two main staircase in the main building, and it's the most preserved um, paintings from uh, the GDR times, what was created by the Belarusian artists there. And interestingly, um, in this year, everything changed. Uh, they, preserve, they still preserve this painting, but now it's look just a month ago, like this. So they cover it with the curtains, and um, uh, you can see that, uh, yeah, in the other stairs it's the same. And this is not only curtains, they give us explanation to why, why it is like this, and that they will not uh, destroy these paintings. They just cover it due to uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, they think that uh, democracy and peace will help to recover um, these paintings, almostly. Um, at the same time, it's interesting who creating this exhibition and text and this application for World Heritage status. And this is um, local uh, experts, and they decided themselves who will be the author of the text for exhibitions, and they even have no call for, open call for experts. They just have a contact of some scientists or a local activists who decided to write something about uh, Hellerau case. And in, in, in this situation, we have uh, the story from the beginning till the end when the local experts creating all the story of the places. So they are the main actors in this situation and they try to avoid others to influence um, their idea what is Hellerau and what was the past of this um, place. Um, so um, they renovated and uh, also the barracks buildings on the both sides of the main hall. And um, as you can see nowadays, um, even in the situation when they have uh, a part of the site connected with a specific historical period, they try to avoid, again, um, information about this period and avoid memories from this period to be retranslated uh, from the exhibition or through um, the painting itself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. So you uh, spent more time for discussion to us. <laughs> and, and we can be glad to join the dinner later in time. But uh, this is an interesting case studies and actually co compl complementary to the case study and the topic of uh, Alena Pfosa. So I'm glad we can discuss these two lectures uh, later. But now it's uh, time for Vieran Pavlakovic, uh, and I am glad to introduce him to you. He is an associate professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at the University of Rijeka, Croatia. He received his PhD in history in 2005 from the University of Washington and has published articles on various topics like cultural memory, transitional justice in the former Yugoslavia, and the Spanish Civil War. He was uh, also the lead researcher on the Memoryscapes project as part of Rijeka's European Capital of Culture in 2020, and a co-founder of the CRES Summer School on traditional justice and memory politics. So we are glad to have you here, Vieran, and the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction and the invitation to be here, and also the 
um, a great uh, presentations uh, at the earlier part of the panel, and just not just about memory, but all these different strategies of uh, forgetting or oblivion, and hopefully I'll touch on that a little bit as well. And uh, this is not a refined paper, it's actually the beginning of a new research project, which I actually just applied for, so it's a little bit uh, looser than maybe some of the other uh, presentations. Uh, so it'll be maybe like a, a visual appetizer for dinner, which I'm sure people are already thinking about. Um, on. Okay. Uh, so I'm focusing on the former Yugoslavia, but really also looking at Croatia and Serbia as my main uh, case studies. And to understand sort of memory politics uh, for Croatia, Serbia, and the other former Yugoslav republics, it's really three overlapping um, kinds of collective memory. Uh, the Second World War, and then of course the war in the 1990s, perhaps the most, uh, the strongest ones, but it's also the third one, which is the, the memory of socialism or the communist regime. And so these are oftentimes uh, uh, interwoven, entangled, uh, and even it's also reflected in the remembrance practices, whether it's the, the monuments or the commemorations, uh, things that I'm looking at more now are popular culture and with these digital techniques, you know, these new kinds of media and different kinds of new kinds of remembrance. And I think it's really particularly an interesting point right now uh, in um, Croatia and the other uh, republics because it's about 30 years after the war has uh, uh, begun and uh, these memories, these collective memories now really are being at this political uh, level, of this inst institutionalization. We have the museums, we have the uh, most of the monuments, they're in the textbooks, they're the official movies, uh, the, at least especially for Croatia, there's the generals that are advising uh, textbook production and so on. Uh, but there is still some bottom-up uh, uh, efforts and a lot of it is in the form of uh, street art, murals, and graffiti. And uh, a question that uh, a scholar of actually Northern Ireland has asked, asked, are these cultural expressions, are they exacerbators of conflict or are they inhibitors? Or this, is this all this memory production, uh, is it like helping to deal with the past or are we just perpetuating the same divisions that were there earlier? And so it's not just the fact that there is a monument or there is a mural, but it's what's on there and what kind of message is being conveyed in here. Of, of course, Northern Ireland is um, perhaps one of the most famous areas for memorial murals uh, showing either you know, very violent ones or perhaps a message for peace. And uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to also reflect on that as well. <clears throat> well, in the former Yugoslavia, and especially between Croatia and Serbia, the past is a new arena of war and conflict. Uh, there was the so-called monument wars also in the last few years. Uh, Serbia unveiled a monument, uh, what they claim is the last uh, Narodni Heroi, actually, of the Yugoslav People's Army, this Milan Tepic, uh, who blew himself up and a number of Croatian uh, defenders in Bjelovar in 1991. Uh, and just before that, Croatia uh, unveiled a monument to uh, a terrorist that murdered the Yugoslav uh, ambassador in Sweden in the 70s and then he had gone on to uh, Paraguay and uh, ended up becoming and volunteering in the Croatian army in 1991 where he's killed I think like a week or so after he arrives. So being celebrated as a, as a soldier or a veteran of the war of the 90s and not as this terrorist um, from previously. But these resulted in uh, diplomatic notes and uh, all kinds of protests. And this, these contested memories go even further back, as I said, the Second World War and cultural production. And this is, um, I mean, there's many, many examples I can give, but this is just one of the concentration camp Yasenovats, uh, a Croatian film, this, uh, The Diary of uh, Diana Budisavljevic, uh, a woman who had helped save uh, Serb children and other children from the Ustasha concentration, co concentration camps, and then a more a brutal vision produced by uh, uh, Serbia, Dada of Yasenovac, also uh, some say is a propaganda uh, piece, but others say it accurately conveys the horrors of the camp. But in any case, these uh, cultural production being used in 
uh, debates about the war. So the main subject is, uh, are, is graffiti or murals or mnemonic murals and memory murals. So there's a whole different uh, kinds of uh, items we can see or whether it's scratchings going all the way back to uh, even Pompeii and uh, many other examples. Of, I'm of course focusing on much the, the more recent ones. This is a kind of a amusing graffiti is forever. In fact, we know it's quite ephemeral and it can be very quickly you know, painted over. It can also be produced very quickly. So it's kind of an interesting moment of bringing in memory politics, uh, or sorry, memory studies to the study of uh, street art, which is itself just now becoming the subject of academic research and studies. It's not just a subcultural uh, thing. Uh, just a, one example of maybe some kind of visual smog or this chaos we can see in many places. This is in, in Prague. Maybe some of you have been to this Lenin wall. Uh, talking about it being ephemeral, this is now what it looks like. And now it's become frozen almost. All that uh, interactive moments of it, now it's officially like you can only paint on it if, if asked. And there's cameras uh, there as well. Um, you know, so some things don't last forever. Uh, there are many other approaches to looking at uh, graffiti or murals. Uh, another interesting uh, <coughs> research subject are these uh, slogans from the um, mid-1940s, immediately after the war, especially in the region of Istria, where the Border Commission was going, and the Communist Party mobilizing its cadres to paint these uh, signs. I don't know if you can really see. It's, uh, um, I think it says, Istria, uh, uh, Hrvatska uh, Istra, and also Istra Yugoslavia, or Hochimo Yugoslavia. Ovo Yugoslavia, sorry, this is Yugoslavia. So various um, messages on the walls that are even retained to this very day. Uh, also other kinds of battles over uh, the Second World War. So is uh, this is in Pula, also in Istria, uh, going from uh, Hero Tito to Tito Bandito. So we can see that the various battles and the colors used, who's graffitiing them. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of work on monuments and memorials, uh, which also tell a certain narrative. And one way to challenge that, especially in the Croatia during the war, it was blowing it up, removing them, changing the text, but also you know, slathering graffiti on it and countering one set of symbols, also script, probably it was uh, in Cyrillic, this is Dobrosello and Lika, with an Ustasha symbol, the symbol of the fascists. So there's all kinds of, of wars, and this is, of course, not just going to the Balkan Wars, uh, but some more recent examples. And we can see how, uh, yes, graffiti and, and murals can be very ephemeral, ephemeral and disappear quickly, but they can also be um, created very quickly and reacting very quickly to contemporary events uh, of various kinds of protests. I thought I was actually teaching a class on revolutions in the Paris Commune right when this came up. So this was a great um, slide to show to my students. Uh, and you know, studying graffiti and murals can be also very difficult. It is, in many ways, a subversive act. It's considered vandalism. A lot of the authors remain to be unknown. This is Hex. I managed to catch him uh, in LA earlier this year uh, doing some work. I had He kept asking me if I was with the police. I was convincing him, no, I'm not. Uh, gave him a business card. I guess that <laughs> convinced him. But, well, you know, he was working in uh, Southern California, in LA, with uh, an area that has drugs and violence and all kinds of gangs. And he was talking about the very positive potential of graffiti and bringing the community together and so on. Now, as I shift back to the Balkans, it's a story that's maybe a little bit uh, different. OK, uh, sorry, Bef one more before. Uh, before uh, getting to the Balkans, is also the, the role of historical murals. So this, these are the kinds of murals that I'm particularly interested in, although other kinds of graffiti is, of course, also interesting. Uh, I find this one um, the fascinating with uh, Poland in between the two forces you know, of Germany and the, the Soviet Union, and also many of these heroic uh, murals that I'm sure many of you have seen uh, throughout Warsaw dedicated to the uprising. <clears throat> Uh, now, what is going on in uh, the former Yugoslavia? So, the, as I said, this is just a project in 
in waiting, and I haven't really started uh, uh, working on it other than doing some basic field work. So who are these artists and organizations that are building and painting and financing murals, specifically war murals, uh, which is what I'm interested in. And there's lots of this Ustasha and other kinds of graffiti around. And why now? All of a sudden, there's an explosion of these war murals throughout um, former Yugoslavia, especially Croatia and, uh, and Serbia, maybe to a lesser extent Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, I don't know how much is going on in, in Macedonia. Well, maybe you can comment on that later. And as I said, I looked a lot at, at monuments, the building of monuments, the blowing up of monuments. But uh, after these 30 years, after it's institutionalized, it's much more difficult to build monuments now in Croatia. And this also limits on to the kind of symbols you can put on it and what you could write on it. So monuments, uh, it's very uh, hard to get um, even these controversial symbols. But painting a controversial mural, that's much easier and also the symbols you can use, you can get away with a lot. Uh, so just another example of these other kinds of uh, graffiti battles, and if one other question about these actors, uh, it's a lot of these ultras, so football fans, these, these groups that are already marking territory, already using controversial symbols, both in Croatia and Serbia. But then again, then that's the, the next step is very professionally done artistic historic murals about the war. And it's probably not necessarily these guys making historical murals, and it's not veterans who are in their 60s. They're also not painting the murals. So you got to figure out who are these groups that are working on it. Uh, there's some examples of graffiti that has become monumentalized. There's, this one even has, oh, I guess I can't really use, well, maybe up there, has its own info board. So an ephemeral object now frozen in time permanently. Um, murals are sacred spaces. It's no longer just a monument where you have candles and you have a commemoration. We can s there's a, a priest over here blessing this mural. This is near Shibenik uh, on, the, on the coast. Uh, these are now sacred spaces. Uh, they're also often close to schools and places where children are. So what are the messages that are being shown, and they're quite graphic. We have some ex an execution scene here. Uh, you can't really see it here, but above this uh, soldier is a name. They wrote the actual name, Stanimirovic, uh, one of the um, the mayor of Vukovar during the uh, occupation, and then later a, a politician in Croatia after the amnesty. But they're you know, basically naming names so the next generation knows who the perpetrators are. Uh, we've got some uh, inter interventions on famous photographs. I don't know if you can really see here, but they have horns and uh, red stars and the Chetnik symbols uh, made particularly uh, emphasized on, on this image. It's a photograph from uh, the fall of Vukovar. And then also just really graphic, um, also street art, uh, and with like the symbol, a Serb symbol and the red star on the, on the glove just part of the, the text, they committed rape and are still strolling around Vukovar. They work in the police, water supply system, city administration, electric company, etc. But the uh, courts are not doing their job. And then it actually names names of uh, perpetrators that, that haven't been tried. <clears throat> so Shmiga is, a, for example, a, um, a nickname of one of the well-known war criminals from Vukovar. So they're really doing uh, yeah, quite graphic uh, calls, but there's also really impressive uh, artistic endeavors. As I, I said, these, are not, these aren't just you know, regular football hooligans running around painting up Ustasha symbols. This is a job that requires you know, months and actually quite a bit of money, and of course, having local governments allow them to do this intervention. Uh, it's actually quite a, a, um, an impressive uh, mural under a viaduct. Uh, but then even Jesus is kind of lurking up here, and then it says, never, never forget. So the messages aren't necessarily ones of moving on. And in Vukovar itself, there are a few um, murals, very dramatic, very emotional. Uh, and thinking about these, okay, uh, what 
I'm not, probably not gonna have time to show you the, some images of recent Croatian monuments, but my argument is maybe the aesthetics of contemporary Croatian monuments is not sufficient to convey these emotional uh, elements that the authors or these mnemonic actors, such as veterans groups or right-wing political groups want. And a mural and these images can provoke those emotions. And this is, I said I was focusing mostly on Croatia and Serbia, but we also have, you know, Srebrenica or, or Bosnia Herzegovina and Srebrenica, many, many murals uh, about that. I don't have time to go uh, through it. And uh, for the, the final part, I wanted, I've shown you a few war murals. Now it's getting even more intense because it's not just war scenes or a battle but actually individuals and not the heroes, but actually convicted war criminals that are in there. Uh, and transitional justice does have a potential of symbolic reparations, whether building monuments or murals or other things, <coughs> cultural interventions for victims. Uh, you know, is there reconciliation? The ICTY had big hopes for reconciliation. We, in fact, we've seen this is not the case. Um, you know, and has there been justice? People would say, no, there's not. Maybe some kind of murals or other public space can have a positive effect. But in fact, we're seeing the contrary. We're seeing these murals actually perpetuating dominant narratives. Uh, and we have convicted war criminals on the walls uh, and these stencils as well. Uh, so here's two Ratko Mladic from a Bosnian Serb commander, probably well known. Uh, convicted for genocide in Srebrenica, and uh, Slobodan Praljak, he was the Croatian Defense Forces, uh, also crimes against humanity, commits suicide in the courtroom, very uh, dramatic moment. Uh, he was, uh, his image was on this um, electric station, and then uh, the city government had it removed, but they accidentally removed a Vukovar mural that was next to it, uh, which freaked people out, and then they, uh, so you can actually see when they covered it up, the, the just Hedoy was left, barely left here, and then they came back and they redid the Vukovar one, the mayor apologized, but they also placed Pradjak back, and then uh, this, um, he, he came up, he was popping up all over, over town. Uh, another uh, soldier, so this, Pradjak and uh, Mladic convicted in the ICTY, in the Hague, uh, so this is a local um, trial. Uh, Mihailov Hrastov was a soldier in the city of Karlovac, uh, machine gunned 13 uh, Serb reservists or Yugoslav people, People's Army's reservists who had surrendered and were unarmed. He machine guns them, and then on the 30th anniversary of that, they make him this mural. And so he served uh, time in, in prison for it. Uh, so not only is his symbol there, and Karlovac is, you know, technically a multi-ethnic town, there still are some Serbs there, but they actually put the gun he used also on the, mur on the mural. So this is definitely a very provocative kind of um, mural or graffiti. Dominant heroic narratives of the war, so something that you would expect to maybe be uh, counter, you know, graffiti, mural, street art, sometimes challenging dominant narratives, in fact, they're perpetuating these. Uh, and maybe a, the, a case that you've, you're familiar with, actually a few months ago in uh, November 2021, this big Ratko Mladic mural in, in Belgrade, it was defaced, and you quickly had these ultras coming and, you know, scraping uh, and cleaning it up, and, you know, are these ultras almost serving as these paramilita paramilitaries during the war, doing the dirty work, and the governments could say, hey, it's not us, you know, we have nothing to do with it, but the police standing by watching while these guys scrubbing it clean. The one in Karlovac also was supposed to be taken down, but the local ultras are like, we're gonna guard this mural with our bodies, and no one's going to um, challenge that. And when um, you know, President Vucic was asked, uh, you know, shouldn't you take this down? Do you think that the problem of the state is to remove, uh, is to remove it? We, we know that we will provoke revolt with that. I mean, he's being, uh, you know, pretty facetious here, I think, about that. And uh, next to Mladic was another um, figure from the Second World War. And I, I'm running out of time, so I'll just wrap up real quick. Uh, also, when criticized uh, for the Mladic mural, uh, 
a Croatian MP Pizzola is criticizing us for the Mladic mural. In Croatia, they have dozens of murals to convicted war criminals. They have streets dedicated to the Nazi war criminal Mila Budak. It was actually removed a few months ago. They have a monument to Miro Barisic. You've seen that one, who was a convicted terrorist. I would rather die than be Pizzola's errand boy. So this is international uh, relations and uh, and struggles and um, again just throwing something in from the more recent uh, events uh, we see that there's also various struggles on the streets of Belgrade whether pro Russia or pro <clears throat> Ukraine uh, and be because I know the f at the end of the conference there will be some reflection on can we move forward I know this presentation was you know, actually quite depressing uh, with the, the current situation, with, whether it's transitional justice, but maybe murals do have this uh, potential. It's just the way, how do, how do we use them? And I'm giving an example from uh, Tucson, where I grew up and went to college there, and we're talking about obliteration, and it's the history of the indigenous peoples and their land that was taken away, and also Hispanic uh, culture. And uh, murals, th there are a few monuments, but actually I think murals are more effective. And this is an interesting one, this is the Tohono O'odham, which is the uh, tribe that uh, has occupied this uh, land for, for thousands of years. And uh, they even appropriated, just as the University of Arizona appropriated their land, they appropriated the font and symbols of the University of Arizona and are saying, no, we are still here, this is, this is our land. So it's kind of, you know, um, taking it back uh, through art, you know, there's other examples also, Black Lives Matter and what's uh, been, been uh, going on. Uh, so just at the end, you know, it's, I'm interested in why is this shift uh, to these murals and unfortunately at the moment, from what I've been observing, is it, they're, they're being used uh, in quite the, the negative way actually to perpetuate the dominant narratives and perpetuate the divisions uh, that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vieran, for these insights to your research project. And uh, before I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Sylvester and asking her for her comments, I would like to encourage our audience uh, at Zoom to ask questions. So long we have no questions on the chat, you are welcome to put them there. And of course, also, I invite everybody here in the conference room to think about their questions to our four speakers. So um, now it's uh, the time for Professor Christina Sylvester. She is a professor of political science at University of Connecticut and is affiliated with the School of Global Studies at University of Gothenburg in Sweden. She has worked extensively outside the US, including Australian National University, the Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands, and Lancaster University in the UK. Sylvester's most recent research and writings are on the state of theory in international relations, war as experience, and art museums and international relations. She is the editor of the Rutledge book series, War Politics Experience. We are glad to have you here and now excited to listen to your comments. Yeah, yeah, just start to talk and we'll... Start to talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm interested very much in a lot of the topics that you've been covering, but probably from a somewhat different point of view. Um, my, my IR point of view is always with me, but it's not a, a, a traditional point of view. It's critical. It's very, very critical of the field. Um, I like these papers here very much because they are about down-to-earth topics, and I'm kind of interested in that. Is this working? Oh. Ha. Huh. Huh. <laughs> As I said, I, I like these papers because they're all on very down-to-earth topics instead of um, uh, abstract, in a sense, abstract situations. And they're, they're about the importance of ordinary people 
in international relations as stakeholders. And they're not usually seen as stakeholders in international relations. And the power they have, along with others, and the disputes they have over memory and how it should be actually uh, made concrete or not, or even mentioned or not. Now, uh, my own work is on uh, war as experience, and that comes out of my background as a feminist. Uh, the feminists were really, in, in the United States and I'm sure elsewhere, uh, were instrumental actually in drawing attention to the different experiences of different types of people in, in a situation and how it's important to actually collect a lot of ideas and to look at what the woman who's washing dishes and looking out at the war, what her experience of war is compared to the soldier, in a sense. Um, so um, I, I moved in that direction in part because I was a feminist, but in part because I couldn't understand why my field of international relations that had been studying east-west conflict for a long time did not anticipate the fall of the Berlin Wall, did not anticipate the Soviet Union going belly up in 1991. I mean, this, this, this is like the big failure. This is a huge failure. Um, so I became interested in knowing kind of what's missing. And what it's missing is really a, 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 an appreciation of the power of ordinary people in certain circumstances. I mean, you think of the Arab Spring. You think, well, first of all, you think of the Berlin Wall, people walking, ba uh, uh, pushing baby carriages through something and living to see the day, the next day. Or you think of the Arab Spring, you may not like the outcome of the Arab Spring, but the United States have been trying to take down you know, some of those leaders for, for a long time and couldn't do it, but people could uh, sit uh, protesting. Or you think about Iran today, you think about the power of women in Iran today, extraordinary. Um, and I'm wondering what IR is thinking about it and what memory, if any, they will have. Uh, or will they will start talking only about the government of Iran. So I'm very interested in the types of things that are going on here. Um, uh, I'm interested mainly in who owns national and world heritage by virtue, really, of linking future memory to determinations today in a sense of the past, and who's involved? Who gets to, in a sense, uh, uh, have the power or the authority to, to certify memory? And it's not as obvious as I think uh, we might think it is. Um, we have four papers, and two of them are somewhat on similar topics, and two on a different topics of tourism or painting or what have you. So let me just say a few things about each one. I think uh, the power by Yulia, uh, the paper by Yulia, uh, is about political tension between various sites and claims of authority over the Garden City project of 1909 uh, uh, and on in the Dresden area of Germany. It's a question over political ownership and struggles that have been going on. Um, the tension includes the World Cultural Guardian UNESCO versus state interests in determining heritage, something we haven't spent too much time with here. There's also tension between locals seeking heritage recognition for an entity of the 20, 20th and 21st century and an indifferent state in UNESCO um, and the question being how, how old do you have to be to have heritage? Um, do you have to be ancient on some level or ruined or what have you? I think that's a very interesting question that you're raising. Uh, and there are the locals. The local stakeholders are really have, has a, have an important role there. Then there are tensions on all sides about an entity uh, under consideration that is, was seized and used for a time by enemies in war, which is a constant with uh, uh, memorials, the Soviets, the SS forces, covering up the paintings now of that time. That's really interesting. It reminds me of the Parthenon Sculptures Museum, the Parthenon Museum that opened with images on the top floor, images of all of the sculptures that are at the British Museum. And then the British refused to return to, to Greece. They cover them you know, so you can go up. I don't know if it's still covered, actually, but you could go up and you could look at them and not see them simultaneously, which is really, really interesting. 
Um, and that kind of tension, what to do when you're annoyed at someone or you're annoyed at a historical situation, um, that comes into play too. So who is an authority on this kind of heritage? And is it the world or local heritage? How are decisions being made? It's really unclear. It's all about politics here. And also, um, again, again, this notion of how old heritage is. I think that's a question that we take for granted and we need to ask more questions on. Jan also has a paper that presents similarly complex political pictures of German, concentra a German concentration camp established for Polish intelligentsia. Um, and there's com complex politics involved in this and complex maneuvering built by the Germans, taken over by the Soviets in 1945, then by Austria in 1955, then private owners of camp lands, uh, of, the ca of the camp lands more recently. Who owns it? Who claims it? Who certifies it? <clears throat> who, builds, who builds stuff on it, on the land? Um, again, here come the locals, though, the former inmates and the families that claim authority to speak on this and were initially met by Austri Austrian indifference and Polish silence under the communist regime. And then 1965, the sale of the land by the Austrian state to private owners who constructed a kitschy Italian villa. I mean, the whole thing is like, I've, it's really unbelievable um, on some level, this particular cycle of ownership. So it amounted to, as one, uh, one uh, person says, to a cultural suppression um, on, on the official sides. And again, the locals will fight back. And as, as Jan pointed out, in 2022, the Austrian government will semi-apologize <clears throat> for its indifference and buy back some of the land in question, saying the camp, quote, wasn't in our memory culture as much as it should have been. That's a loaded comment, it, that something wasn't, it's, it sounds a little innocent and nice, and it isn't, wasn't in our memory culture as much as it should have been. It means there's a lot of contestation probably to continue. But permission to remember is restored, and the state ends up ruling in favor of local interests. Okay. Uh, so, what else was I going to say about that? Um, I was going to go back to my international relations for a moment and say, are there similar local interests in international relations that we keep overlooking and therefore missing uh, locations of power? Um, ordinary people experiencing a variety of things. All right, then we have two other papers. One, uh, Elena's paper. Um, on what I, I got kind of hooked into the, 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 the paradox or the problematic of the tour guide um, uh, and, and in locating, the, locating memory issues in your line of work there. How much uh, cultural darkness to talk about in any particular site and how to talk about it? That's a really good question. Um, how, how to deal with the stuff that you'd really like to pu push aside, but maybe the tourists bring up. Um, and I found it interesting that the way various tour guides that she interviewed said they handle this problem. One said, well, you can de-emphasize. You can de-emphasize uh, something and kind of switch, or deflect or switch the attention to a much more positive present. So just put the past beside and talk about the present. Or you can engage in dialogue with tourists. Usually the tourists want to be the ones who talk. Um, and, and as one person said, um, have a positive outcome. Also talk, exchange of views, a perfect exchange of views. Uh, only sometimes the tourists do not agree with you. So you try to win an argument with them in a sense. It ends up being a contestation that is carefully controlled, but uh, someone is, is, is answering back to the official narrative. I, I, I used to study 
extensively in, sun, in the southern region of Africa, Zimbabwe and South Africa. I remember going into tourist areas in South Africa just to hear what the tourist guide was going to say about things that were really uh, under, under dispute at the time. And I was always surprised. It was usually a white tourist guide um, uh, talking about the virtues of their, their particular understanding. And all of the tourists ganging up on the, on the tourist uh, uh, guide who just held his ground, usually a guy, and, and refused actually to listen to the tourists. So this is kind of an interesting area here. Um, OK, and then we go to Virion. Did I say that? We are pure on. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and I have a real interest in what he's doing here, uh, the impact of um, this new memorialization in the post-Yugoslav society that's based on murals. Um, I was wondering, and you did address it, whether those murals are by local artists, or who gets to actually yeah, take I, space, you know? They're uh, academically trained artists being paid often by the ultras. Oh, so okay. It's not like in Poland where the, there's okay. institutions paying people. Or, or something. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky thing. Um, I like this a whole idea, though, of the mural. When I was in uh, working in the UK, I became the external examiner of the University of Ulster in Derry, their international relations department uh, and their, their war studies. And I was given a group of... Uh, student papers to look over and review. These had already been graded by the professors there. I just uh, not that many of them. And I just started in reading. And um, many of them were fascinating and well written. I remember the day my father was shot. He was sitting in the lounge room reading the, the Irish Times or something like that. And OK, I'm here with you. I'm right with you. And I'm reading all of this. I'm actually enjoying reading these undergraduate papers. Till I get to the end and I see they've gotten a low mark from their professors. And then I start reading the ones that bore me to tears and they start with IR theory. They start with realism or what have you. Um, and they go on and on and on about war and they don't say anything. They, it's as if they don't live in a, in a war zone at all. So I changed all the grades which I didn't realize I would get away with, but as an external examiner, I just switched all of the grades. And the board <laughs> of the university wanted to have a little conversation with me about that. And so it was one of those situations where I was sitting alone, and they were all sitting lined up. And they were really pretty angry. And, and all I said to them is, well, what is your criterion for grading? You're in a war zone. Who's the expert? Who authorizes? Uh, and who has knowledge of war? Uh, and do you think that realist theory has knowledge of war? I don't understand. And they said to me that there's no room for the personal in international relations as a field. And I just determined at that moment, I'm changing that. We're not going to have that anymore, in a sense. But that was an actual official opinion. So we had actually a good conversation, and I survived. Um, and then I went out and looked at the murals <laughs> uh, at that time. Um, and I think that they're really brilliant. I'm also a big fan of Banksy for a very similar reason, you know, in the UK and around. The actual political message at times can be much uh, better than, uh, than the, the writing. So here's how I wanted to end a little unconventionally, if, we, if, if you don't mind. Let's contest history right here for a moment. Let's look at how history is being contested with art in one situation I'm familiar with and you may or may not be familiar with. So I have one picture. Can we have my picture? Hello, picture people. Ah, uh, I love it. I love it. This is Kahindi Wiley. He's an African-American artist who I think is really would be sitting here right nodding his head at much of what he's heard. Uh, he, he has a series called Rumors of War, and he replaces the white guys. And this is Napoleon crossing the Alps. You know, it was uh, Jacques-Louis uh, David's uh, painting. Um, 
he, he replaces, he, he takes everything meticulously from the classical painting done by whites of whites, and he replaces them with young black men. Um, and just to talk about this for one second, he does, he chooses the model through street casting in Brooklyn. His studio is in Brooklyn, New York, and he goes out and he knows a lot of guys. Um, and he picks a model and talks to the model about what the context is and what he wants to do. But one thing that's very interesting is he lets the model choose what clothing to wear. So everything is the same except the race of the, of the uh, 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 rider, the clothing. He's got on some, some Timberland, Timberland boots and, and what have you, and a, and a bit of a bit different around on the, on the ground. But basically, um, it's a real knock on historical discourse. On the one hand, and it, it fits what someone was saying, on the one hand, these murals are a challenge to politics. And on the, one, on the other hand, they're complicit on some level. So what Kahindi does is he changes the race very powerfully. I remember when I first saw this painting, I was across the, uh, the gallery quite a distance, and I just sort of ran towards it laughing, not at it, but just at the, oh, that's perfect. You know, what a perfect idea. Um, but he doesn't challenge the context of war, right? So it's complicit in a certain way. And I've had a conversation with him about this, actually. He is, by the way, the artist that, that Barack Obama chose to have his official presidential uh, picture painted by. That was after I, I had met him. But I asked if I could use this painting in a book that came out in uh, 2019, curating and recurating the American wars in, in Vietnam and Iraq. And I remember my, my agent at Oxford said, you better have deep pockets. This guy's really hot right now. You know, he's like, oh boy. So I just wrote him an email and he said, can you send me the pages where you're using my work? And I did. And you know what he, turned, he wrote back? He said, I'm so glad to see someone's focusing on war instead of on race relations entirely, which is what was happening. So he gave me the painting for free. Not the painting itself, but to use in my book. This is actually a big deal. Um, so here's a set of contestations that I just wanted to help and introduce everyone to if they don't know it, but not to take away from your work, just to add on to it. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, very much for this inspiring comments and for the presentation of this uh, artwork. And uh, now we uh, start with our Q&A session and we have actually a first question uh, on the chat. It is to Vieran and I'm going to read it. Should we consider that mural painting is just yet another popular means of expression captured by the ruling nationalist allied? Is there any example of counter-narrative via morals in ex-Yugoslavian countries? I can think only about digital examples on social media. For example, see the joint mascots of the cities of Zagreb, Sarajevo and Belgrade, brought up in online images. For example, in relation to the earthquake in Croatia or to the, now I don't know what it means, Pride or Pride in Belgrade. But I have not seen these painted on, actually, on actual walls. This is a question of David Denti. Thank you for the question, David. Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are a few that uh, focus on uh, actually anti-fascist women. There's one in Pula. Uh, I think uh, Rosa Rosanda, she was uh, an anti-fascist and then later became, uh, she left in the, the f after the Second World War and was an editor of a communist newspaper in Italy. And so there's a very interesting mural to her. And there's another one uh, in Split of a young woman who was killed by the Italian occupation. And there, she has a street named after her. And there's it's actually a narrow street and it's kind of hard to get a good picture of it. And there recently, uh, left-wing parties had a commemoration for 
um, Anti-Fascist Day, which is uh, the 22nd of June. So there are a few cases, but uh, it would be interesting for these NGOs and other youth organizations to try to initiate more of this. The difficulty, I think, is because these ultras, um, I mean, just as their tags and other symbols on the streets, they're demarcating territory. Uh, you know, they're quite dangerous, uh, I think, in terms of controlling the streets. I had another example, which I took out for, for time's sake, but it was a, a big mural of the Little Prince, which the, p the people in the neighborhood loved. And then the local uh, ultras, the Bad Blue Boys, plastered over a giant tank shooting and Vukovar and all these things. And Vukovar is, is a very powerful site of memory. And um, for the first 20 years after the war, usually the Vukovar street would have some kind of mural or graffiti. But now it's every neighborhood has Vukovar. And now every neighborhood has to have a tank and these explosions. And now it's really gotten quite out of hand. So, you know, I think it'd be, yes, we need more. Um, these historic murals, and as I think the, the person commenting, there are th these small interventions. And then I was at a street art festival conference in Ljubljana uh, earlier in the summer, and there was a paper about uh, a Serbian street artist that was doing these very simple interventions. But uh, I think that that artist no longer even lives in Serbia. So yeah, the, the, the situation and the nationalism, which has now been institutionalized, these na nationalist narratives, plus this quasi-paramilitary, you know, ultras, makes it very difficult to have other kinds of voices, uh, at least in, in public. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we have several questions here in the audience, but I also wanted to invite the speakers to react maybe to the comments of uh, Christine. So... Uh, for a first round, please wait for a moment. Does anybody want to react on the comments first? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but if you want to talk, you need to put in. Yes, I, 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 I'm very happy that you, uh, 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 that, that you see the, the problem of, uh, of Guzan and uh, 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 and and the topic of this memory game, uh, mm. what uh, happens in Jews and, and, and so uh, thank you once again. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Ivona, please pass the mic. I I have not seen now the uh, who was first. So just um, we collect a few questions and then continue with... Yeah, uh, my name is Tim Waters. I'm from Indiana University. I had a question for Vieron and for Yulia, if I can. Um, uh, so, really interesting uh, uh, presentations. I was curious if you have any sense at this point about like the geographic distribution of these murals. Are there, especially the ones by the ultras, are, are, are they just placed opportunistically, strategically? I know like the ones in Northern Ireland tend to be sort of border demarcations in a way. Are, are these doing that kind of work, or are they are they located in a place, or just just in convenient places? Uh, and I, just to add, I, I didn't see any mention of the murals uh, uh, on the, the the wall in, um, uh, in near Bethlehem. Uh, uh, I, I was wondering if you were going to be looking at those. That, that's a really you know important mural site, the walled off hotel area uh, on the the wall between uh, Jerusalem and, and, and Bethlehem. Uh, it's really a, an interesting one because it's one of the most sort of internationalized mural sites where it's not just local populations, but mostly people coming from other places. There are sort of often uh, elite taggers and whatnot. Um, uh, and for, for Yulia, this is a really interesting presentation. I wasn't sure where you were going at first, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering, the, the two examples you gave of sort of elision uh, 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 of, of uh, mentions of the, 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 the National Socialist and, and, and uh, Communist periods, uh, is this, is this a, an elision that's being generated just sort of spontaneously by the organizers out of a sense of embarrassment or they want their own narrative, or are they responding to what they understand as a strategy for the UNESCO definition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There were more questions here. Yeah. And also. 
Right, thank you very much. My name is Ajan Shershenova. I'm from the OSCE Academy in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And I have a question to Alona. Actually, that is a, a really interesting presentation for us because we have done similar data collection with tour guides in a museum in Bishkek. And we supported, uh, basically we did lots of paid uh, tours, like private tours, and we employed everyone we could, like my students, my co-authors, husband, myself, my co-author. We just went on the same tour over and over again to hear how different tour guides present history in different ways. And uh, we did not look into this because we looked into public diplomacy more. But I wonder if you looked at the correlation between the background of the tour guides, the personality, the self-identification, age, gender, uh, ethnic belonging, and the positions or what they prefer to talk about and what they skip, because that's what we discovered as well. Like male tour guides would prefer to talk about weapons of the First World War. <laughs> uh, female ethnic Kyrgyz uh, talk about decolonization, for example. All the female tour guides stick to the script and don't deviate at all from the script. So <laughs> we found it quite curious how different the tours were. And it's only five guides within the museum, but we heard like five different histories of the same stuff with the same script at the same museum. So I wonder if you had um, looked into the positionality of the uh, tour guides. Thank you. Okay, Bartosz and Kasim. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I have a few uh, comments, questions, maybe to Alena Fozer. Thank you very much for the great um, paper. Um, first of all, I was wondering whether these guides are educated by some kind of institution where you could see whether there are some guidelines or is it simply uh, what they are saying? Is it a, an effect of what they learned on their own? Then, um, have you checked also the Russian guidebooks, so the uh, tour guides, sorry, so that um, you could know what the tourists might be expecting while coming to these respective towns? And then, who creates the tours schedule? Um, is it the choice of the tourists or the tour guides? Because one thing is what they say, the other is what they actually show, right? <laughs> and the last thing is, um, have you maybe compared the issues um, shown by to the Russian uh, tourists with the uh, issues shown to some other, like, German tourists? Because these are also um, contested memories, um, and then I would be interested to know how these tourists react and how the tour guides uh, react to those tourists. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And one more question. Uh, also, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. please go ahead. Hello, um, my question um, is also for Aliona, actually. Well, it's a comment and a, and a question, which I hate doing. But um, so <laughs> um, the f it's just very quickly, I just wondered whether or not maybe there'd been some um, winter's term, I think, is heritage diplomacy. Um, I really hate to bring up, but it's just because I'm speaking tomorrow about memory diplomacy and my theorization of it. And I'm going to look really awkward and weird if people are like, why are you not referencing the fact that somebody else used it um, in an article published six years before the article that I published? Um, so that's why I just wanted to, to clarify on that. And then the other question is about the role of the tourist, um, because it's such a fascinating project that you've done. And obviously, I've told you before how fascinating I find it. But I, I suppose I have a question about the personal. So when they feel when the tour guides feel conflicted, um, maybe in providing a different historical narrative, um, how did they, did they sort of justify that to themselves or how did they, and did they see themselves as sort of having this role of, as like a mediator of history or as an educator um, or, or more as a sort of entertainer, I suppose. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, so uh, Bradley Reynolds again, University of Helsinki. Um, this, yeah, I just wanted to also follow up with kind of a comment slash open question for everyone. Um, I think in social psychology and neuroscience literature, there's a lot of discussion too on how memory 
is also related to images of the future. And I think this is something that came up in a lot of the presentations, especially when we think about uh, the murals of the past being covered over or kind of the mural wars about how Putin or Russia is presented or in Austrian um, uh, Polish bilateral relations or kind of um, human interactions. And so this was just kind of a question is, what do you do, you, are there comments on how these memory politics kind of influence images of the future in all of these different cases? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think, um, please keep your, or is it a follow up? I would ask you to keep your questions and first uh, we have an answering round. There are three questions or comments to Alena and one to Julia, one to Vieran. So maybe Julia, you start. Mm -hmm. um, about the um, strategy for application, we, we can say that this is true because when you applying with something, you need to say that we will preserve it. Mm -hmm. And when we have really contested memories and contested painting, and even nowadays we are not sure that we want to show it to public or not, it's really difficult to include such a thing in your application. So that is why I think this is really the strategy for the local experts not to have such a focus on this Soviet and SS period in their application too. Mm -hmm. Can you pass a mic yeah. to you? Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, Bethlehem, is, Bethlehem would be a, a great example, especially as, as a border wall, and I, I didn't choose that because mostly I focus on the places that I've visited myself, so that's what I drew upon. But um, yeah, of, of course, if I, if I get the funding, I'll definitely do a much <laughs> more intense uh, background check. But I did make it down to Nogales, Arizona, which is the border with the Mexico-U.S. border, and hoping to find a number of murals there, and there is a lot of street art, but very little was um, dealing with uh, issues of migration or the border and such as that. So it was, I think the actual city council was a little bit afraid of it. There was more provocative uh, murals in Tucson, uh, which is about 90 kilometers north of, of Nogales, but the border area actually was quite clear of them, and the the wall there is more of a fence, so it was actually difficult to paint on. Now, for the Croatian distribution, uh, I mean, the big sites are Split, Osijek, Zagreb, Rijeka, and Pula. Uh, but a lot of, all throughout Dalmatia, there's lots of murals as well. And in terms of like within a, a town, as I said, a lot of them would be on the street named after uh, Vukovar primarily, but also some other ones. Uh, but there are many cases where they're scattered around just where it happens to be like, um, an overpass or a, you know some a, some wall space like for example the uh, Mihailo Hrastov is actually close to the bridge where he did do his killing so that's also a very problematic uh, location and I just wanted to uh, comment also for Pula and Osijek uh, which have the ultras uh, their color uh, Pulas are yellow and green and they have Istria generally has sort of its own identity. Uh, and uh, Osijek, Koharta, there's, it's blue and white. Yet, with the Vukovar murals, they use the Croatian uh, tricolor. They've actually started adding it on there, and it's almost a way of, for ultras to show, yes, we're local patriots, and maybe even, you know, this Eastern identity, but uh, now they've started adding just, the, sometimes a small tricolor, the red, white, and blue Croatian flag, or even using those colors. So, like, for an Osijek and Koharta, everything's white and blue, except for the Vukovar monument. And that has, uh, even even their Shahovnitsas, the Croatian coat of arms would be white uh, white and blue, but in that case. And I just, for uh, uh, I have to do a comment uh, for Elena as well, because I thought that was a fascinating research project. And I just wanted to uh, give an example. I was on a summer school in Prague with uh, University of Regensburg, and we went on a tour to try to see the representations of the communist past. And we're like all excited with the students there. And the tour guide is a 22-year-old 22, 22 American guy from Atlanta, <laughs> Georgia, who's telling us about World War II and communism. So 
<laughs> it was really, you know, that's the complete commodification of the past in mm -hmm. Prague. I guess they're desperate for anything. So, mm -hmm. uh, fasc fascinating research project. Okay, I just remember the question of Bradley about uh, memory related to images of the future. So we can come back to this. And now I ask Elena to answer to the uh, three questions and commentaries on her lecture. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Yeah, I, I tried to answer them. There's quite a lot and I made a lot of notes. So uh, remind me if I, if I forget something. So just to, to begin with, which guided tours did we look at? These are commercial guided tours that had a general orientation and we could have also looked, and it would have been really interesting to look at uh, two guides coming from Russia and doing guided tours with groups of Russians in these cities. But uh, it would have been difficult to get access to them uh, because they're closed groups, they're pre-booked. And uh, I was also interested in this uh, question of international relations in tourism. So that's why we focused on local tour guides who offered tours in Russian language. And uh, this, this is quite a diverse group of tour guides. So some have licenses and others do not have licenses. Mm -hmm. Most of them would have licenses because even it, if it's not a requirement, it still is uh, like a, a confirmation of their uh, prof uh, professionalism. Um, so people who work in the sector for several years, they would ordinarily get a license and the license is an accreditation they get but it and they do uh, some training uh, and have to do a, an example guided tours but in terms of how they create the route and uh, the, the narrative they can draw on what they learned in this course and they can draw on sometimes companies provide them with with narratives but uh, but again guys who have been working in the business for some time that they would, would develop their own narrative and also their own route uh, so it's very flexible in terms of what they speak about. What is about what about the positionality? How does how's that how does that shape what they talk about? It's difficult to really uh, get some clear patterns. I think ethnicity matters, um, especially in in um, Estonia and in Kazakhstan. Um, uh, but it is a sector. It's Russian language uh, uh, guided tours, so you would have largely. Russian um, like, uh, people who belong to the Russian ethnic minority doing the Russian language tours in in yeah uh, for, for Russians coming from Russia and, and and other Russian speakers but they are still perceived as the locals and I think of themselves as locals so that's important to, to know and I, one of the questions I had when I began, began the project is would they use this opportunity as a, as a way of criticizing their own state for ethnic minority politics, but uh, no, they do uh, speak from the position of being a local and also having a pride, uh, having pride in being from a place and that matters quite a lot. I think in terms of the political orientation, uh, some would say they don't want to don't want to talk about their own opinion. They are apolitical or even if they have, if they, if they have an opinion, they wouldn't Want, want, want to, don't want to share that with the tourists. Whereas I think it largely comes down to experience, how much they uh, see this as an opportunity to uh, sh correct certain views of the past and engage in the dialogue. How confident are they? Those who have more years of experience, they feel often more confident than, than others who just started that uh, in, the, in the training, they would be told not to engage in these conversations. And there are some strategies on how to cut them down that they, they would share. Um, I think there are some generational differences in tour guiding styles. Those who were educated in the Soviet period would have often a kind of quite a lecturing style, which is less inter interactive than others, but there has been a generational change already. So those who work in the, in the sector right now, they are they, usually they have an experience of up to like 15 years, something like that, but largely as so educated after, after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, I think whether they speak about political history, social history, art history, uh, there, there are quite significant differences in what they speak about, but this also depends on their professional background and their own interest, what they bring to the guided tour. Um, so uh, it's difficult to pin down any patterns apart from, I think, experience matters significantly and their self-understanding, how much they see themselves as an educator or an entertainer and um, and uh, and that I can I can see uh, in in the data very much. Um, 
I did not do a systematic study on differences between guiding for Russians and for Germans or other nationalities, but I did go to a few guided tours that were offered in English language just to see uh, what, what are the differences. The nation figures much more in um, a national suffering and, um, and suffering under the communist period in Tallinn for, for tourists who are not from, uh, for, from, from Russia. Uh, and two guys would say they have a greater interest in that topic, also in Soviet history uh, in general, and, uh, and, and, and also they know less about uh, Estonia, and that's why they need to talk more about the nation. But I find that I think there's something uh, quite interesting happening here, that when they speak to Russian, the Russians, they would, uh, they would avoid certain sensitive topics, but they would um, uh, talk about uh, the, the shared history in, uh, in a largely positive way when they talk about it, but uh, but they feel that they do not feel the need to kind of introduce the nation as a main subject. And I think that, yeah, because they assume Russians already know about part of the history, but also I think because it's a, they don't want to present a nationalist uh, view of history in relation to the Russians. So I think two of these dynamics happening simultaneously. In relation to a change question on the kind of conceptual framework, uh, and uh, in the paper that I submitted, I do refer to more work on uh, on memory diplomacy and also your 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 paper that uh, that that you have written. Um, I found Tim Winter's understanding of heritage diplomacy useful here because he focuses on moments of exchange and collaboration and less about image making and influencing um, what's happening in. Uh, um, uh, in other states of their, their own image than in, in other states. So I think that's why I found it more useful for my own, for my own study. But um, yeah, I do acknowledge that there's more work that has been written in relation to memory diplomacy explicitly. Um, so I hope I have now addressed most of the comments. Well, uh, you yes. haven't addressed the question about gender, yeah, whether it differs uh, if women or men are talking the guides. Yeah? This was the question of the scholar from Bishkek. I understood this well? No? Yeah, I, it would, I would be really interested in having a conversation about your research findings. That sounds mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, I know nothing that I... that. that no, I, I would not say that there's a kind of systematic difference, mm -hmm. but in terms of so there, there's some differences in professional background and mm -hmm. um, there's some art historians who we had and they focused on that. So we, I think that is a bit gendered in terms of the thematic orientation and what kind of histories they would talk about, but not in terms of um, what I spoke about today, uh, whether they would uh, try to um, engage in, in a dialogue um, or avoid. avoid. Mm -hmm. it's not, that's not gendered. Okay, thank you, Alena, for elaborating on all these comments and questions. And uh, we have uh, some questions left in the conference room. Kruja? Yeah, she's coming, she's arriving. <coughs> thank you. So uh, I was thinking of uh, this morning's presentation on, on Charlottesville. I mean, in which Charlottesville was mentioned and this and how this young woman's reaction to a, a monument sparked a lot of action. And I was thinking of Yeran's presentation of having various uh, war criminals, particularly, uh, you had an example of, the, of um, the general who killed 12 people. And I was thinking of what's happening in the local community as a form of, of reaction. And um, about 10 years ago when I was living in Belgrade, I, I had friends who were basically, whenever they would not see people, they will, they will take a sign or they will, they will cover a, a small, tag or graffiti that, was, that they, they, they thought as politically problematic on, on the far right. I'm curious, in, in your examples, whether you saw forms of resistance, forms of how, how the groups or individuals take, act, take, take a stand, take action, they try to, uh, to react to the little prince, uh, and whether they actually go, in the example of the Charlottesville, to letters, to kind of more um, bigger campaigns or even legal action. I'm curious whether that you, you found this already or whether you want to look at that in the future because also this is the beginning, so, yeah. Um, my question is about the world heritage. It seems to me the UNESCO World Heritage stopped being world to be nationalistic very often. 
So if you have a look at the East Asia, so all these nation states, when they suggest a, you know, certain a proposal to be selected as a world, UNESCO World Heritage, they always with an intention of emphasizing our national glories and something like that. So we have a very, very sharp controversies about the Japanese proposal to be selected as world heritage, especially Japanese modern, modern a historical heritage, because they recruited or mobilized forced labor from colonial Japan and Taiwan, but that history was totally erased in their proposal to the UNESCO. So it was, it provoked a problem. But in the case of Germany, in Dresden, your case, I don't think that it was Germany who built several hundred buildings. It was people who built those buildings. But who are these people? Those builders were only German builders built this, or were there any uh, immigrant workers from, from Poland or from other countries? Also, the architects who made the project of those buildings were only German architects? Or certain, were there any uh, Czech secessionist architects who made these projects? So who are people behind that great, uh, these you know, buildings and projects? So, my question is, if in the suggestion, in the proposal paper that Dresden or our German government submitted to the UNESCO, do they include such a transnational traces of those, uh, these UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage in Dresden? Mm -hmm. Simple question. Thank you. I don't see any more fingers up, so I think we can close the session. And I would ask uh, Julia and Vieran to answer to these two questions. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the question, Gruya. Uh, the sad part about Karlovac, I mean, is it's actually probably quite monoethnic ethnic now. I think the, the Serb population is, is very small there, so there, there probably would be not the similar situation as we heard of someone walking past it. However, uh, soon after it was put up, red paint was uh, splattered on it, and the photos that I took, um, if you look closer, you can still see the, the red paint on it, but I, it's not the picture that I used. It to, I wanted to show the machine gun in my uh, image that I uh, showed, but there's still traces of paint. And in Osijek, there's actually a youth group that goes around and they put a stencil over the Ustasha symbol saying this is hate speech. And uh, you actually saw that in one of the images I had. It was kind of hard to see because whoever was doing it, they came back over and put even a bigger U on it. So it's really like a, a, a battle about um, uh, over these symbols. And thank you for the great question, I, for uh, Bradley's question about the future, uh, because this youth group in Osijek, not only are they crossing out the hate speech, they're trying to come up with new more positive <clears throat> murals and graffiti. And they realize that the only way to prevent these right-wing fascists from tagging over it, they had to like use actually like patriotic colors and Osijek symbols. So all what they're doing is also in a way rather patriotic. So that way it's, they're you know playing the name game or the memory game of using the same kind of symbols and that way no one is, they've left it up because it's also very, you know, for Osiek um, in the future. And I wanted to, I didn't comment on this in this presentation, but also regarding the future in Vukovar, which <clears throat> is um, represented and remediated throughout Croatia with all these different streets and these monuments and these murals on the streets. Um, Vukovar itself has very few historical murals and a very interesting project in the last five years is called Vukovart. And it's a street art festival, and they bring in about 10 street artists internationally, also including Serbia, and they tell them about the history of Vukovar, and they t say, do not make war-related graffiti or street art. And they've made really amazing um, graffiti interventions and these street art, which I would say is a vision of the future. And this one neighborhood, Borovo Naselje, uh, which was devastated during the war, is now uh, illustrated with about 10 or 12 really amazing, um, colorful uh, murals. And the place just looks so much better. So that is a step forward. So there are some positive um, uh, elements in this story. But that was a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you. I want to answer about uh, who are the people. And uh, yes, in the application, there is information about the architects, and there is like four main architects, and there was a complex. My fourth slide was uh, with a map with different colors, and depending on the colors, there was the name of the architect. So it was a complex of the building creating by each architect. And um, this is one of the biggest part of the application documentation is connecting with this um, um, architects and their work, because this is um, um, the idea of uh, Gartenstadt, uh, the garden city idea, so it's really the main idea of application is their work and the idea of uh, to have one manufacturer and have a um, green area for workers of uh, this manufacturer. So Hellerau before was um, a separated city and now it's a part of Dresden, but historically it was created as a separate unit. So it uh, can be lead separately, not by the Dresden city administration, but itself. Hmm. And uh, about the um, um, immigrants, or um, I can say only that um, they try to create um, to more exhibition panels about female um, um, artists and female um, as a part of this rhythmic institute and a contemporary dance um, movement. Because nowadays, um, most, um, mostly all uh, exhibition is about men and not about, <laughs> there is no information about any female, almost like character what's connected somehow with the history of Hellerau. So this is, I think, important step and to include only, not, as you mentioned, not only like German architects, but who created these buildings and who was involved in this process. Yeah, mm -hmm. so thank you for this question. And I think this is next step, I hope, but I can't be sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. Thank you one more time, all the speakers, for this inspiration lectures and discussing. Thank you to the audience online, the audience here, that you stayed with us until the evening and uh, <laughs> the last panel this day. I think it was a great first conference day. Thank you, everybody who prepared and organized it for the technical support and uh, the uh, covering here uh, in the social media. And now I'm happy to announce that there is a dinner waiting for us. <laughs> and actually, we are not late because the dinner is uh, scheduled for 8 p.m. And we are just in time. So we are invited to go to the um, conference room where we had already lunch and the coffee breaks and to share the dinner and the evening. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm.